The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. Tonight, as the third wave of COVID-19 is in full swing in Sri Lanka and movements once again restricted, the economy seems to take another hit. The government continues to say that the economy needs to be secured while managing the health pandemic as Sri Lanka cannot afford another fall. So what's the trajectory of our economy? Positive outlooks which were modelled in the first and second wave are they still accurate or is Sri Lanka in for another surprise? Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is where Other Dharana and the Morning investigates. Hello everyone, good to see you back here again on Investigates. This is where we dive deep into issues that's concerning the Sri Lankan public and try and give you a 360 degree take on the matter so you can make an informed decision. Tonight we focus on Sri Lanka's economy. Now, according to both the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and the World Bank, the country's economy shrunk by 3.6% in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact. However, the World Bank Sri Lanka Development Update Economic and Poverty Impact of COVID-19 report, which was released early April this year, predicted that the economy would recover this year to grow by 3.4%, an almost 180 degree turn from the 2020 performance, mainly due to foreign investments and tourism, among other economic activities. Now, the central bank was even more optimistic, stating that the country's economy would record a 6% growth on the back of improved local manufacturing and services. However, these forecasts came before the third wave hit the country following the single and Tamil New Year. And therefore, the basis on which these predictions were made may not be valid as of now. So what's our country's economic trajectory? Can we survive the third wave? Can we actually get back on track and ensure that the economy survives while the health pandemic decreases steadily away from this country? We investigate. During the first wave, the Sri Lankan government imposed an island-wide curfew which lasted almost two months. However, when the second and third wave broke out in October last year and April this year, the government stated that the country's economic activities have to continue regardless of the pandemic. However, in the face of increasing caseloads and rising daily death tolls, the government changed its stance and imposed a two-week travel restrictions with occasional brief windows of relaxation. Amidst the first outbreak of the pandemic, the government also imposed restrictions on imports and these restrictions have mostly been maintained despite some relaxation for more than a year. The local industries have been divided on this policy, with many arguing that it negatively impacts the economy and others arguing that it helps strengthening local manufacturing. To look into how the pandemic, in particular the restrictions on movement and imports, have affected Sri Lanka so far and will affect it for the rest of the year, and what the policymakers can do differently to spur an economic revival, we spoke to several economists to get their point of view. Now, speaking of the impact the pandemic has had on Sri Lanka's economy, especially those concerning the prevailing import restrictions, leading business cycle economist Dr. Kenneth Dizelwa, who serves in an advisory capacity at the Central Bank of Sri Lanka Monetary Policy Consultative Committee and Financial System Stability Committee, said that misrepresentation of facts must be corrected and that there is no import ban, but an import rationalization rollout plan, with all immediate and capital imports being currently permitted despite Sri Lanka's external debt challenges. He noted that it is important to look at the merchandise trade deficit when talking about disruptions for the lack of domestic savings that prevents us from rapid industrialization and creating an external debt sustainability environment. He added that, therefore, 
only by looking at solutions for this chronic merchandise trade gap can Sri Lanka move forward as this is the cause of the country's economic problems along with excessive external borrowings. So if you look at what happened in 2020, the global GDP contracted by about 4.5%, that is as per the IMF statistics. Now Sri Lanka too had to face a similar contraction where its economy contracted by 3.3%. Uh, the second such time that we've seen this, the previous uh, uh, period we saw this was in 2001, and this is the second such instance, but this instance is unprecedented because the world over economies suffered a similar fate, not only Sri Lanka. Therefore, the Sri Lankan economy, compared to rest of its peers, some of its Asian peers in particular, has done relatively well, if you look at countries like even Thailand or Indonesia or in fact Maldives uh, and you look at some of the European countries, their GDP is contracted far more than what Sri Lanka had seen in 2020. So from a Sri Lankan point of view, I don't think there is too much to be worried about because I think Sri Lanka has used this period to restructure its economy and that's something very positive because during this period, we saw a, a, a significant shift in the production model which Sri Lanka has now institutionalized with its overall macroeconomic framework to support this drive. And therefore, the future of uh, the Sri Lankan economy seems to be in relatively good shape. He further noted that Sri Lanka annually purchases a number of consumer imports, including 1,200 million US dollars worth of vehicles, 400 million US dollars of pharmaceuticals, 300 million dollars of dairy products, 300 million US dollars fruits and vegetables, 300 million dollars on wheat and maize, 200 million dollars on vehicle spare parts, 200 million dollars on sugar, 180 million dollars on furniture, 150 million dollars on electronic items and 120 million dollars on onions. Well, firstly, there is a misconception about the current import uh, framework. I call it a framework because there isn't import restrictions placed. Uh, it is more an import rationalization that is taking place line item by line item. Purely for this and a simple reason is to manage this huge merchandise trade deficit that we face, which is about $10 billion. Now this particular value is unmanageable and not sustainable in the long run because Sri Lanka uses its domestic savings, particularly the hardened savings of all the private transfers that come into Sri Lanka, to consume these imports. And therefore Sri Lanka is left either to go and borrow or further look at selling some of its assets to finance this particular gap that we see. So these are not healthy conditions and these are not sustainable in the long run and therefore Sri Lanka has made a conscious decision during this period to rationalize its imports. Economist and Samagijana Balavegia parliamentarian Dr. Harsha De Silva, however, expressed doubts about the country's economic management. He stated that the country's economic management, especially in light of the pandemic, is questionable and that the country will see the repercussions of unwise economic decisions in the coming few months. He also said that the only way Sri Lanka would be able to move ahead is by engaging more with the world economically. According to the government, the economy uh, only contracted in one quarter last year, second quarter, third quarter and fourth quarter, uh, both were positive. Mm-hmm. And therefore, uh, the economy contracted only by 3.5%. So, what they are saying is, uh, you know, even with the uh, virus, the pandemic, f- the second wave, and the economy wasn't impacted. The economy was impacted only with the first wave. Speaking of the businesses affected by the pandemic, especially on the third wave, Dr. Harsha Disoma said that the degree to which businesses would be affected would vary depending on the nature of the business. He, however, said that Sri Lanka still has to wait and see what sort of plan the government would come up with to address the situation. Because if you look at businesses, you know, a lot of the businesses 
uh, uh, running at a at a at a much lesser capacity than they would otherwise. But on the other hand, you know, sort of some service companies, some tech companies, and all <laughs> have not been impacted at all. But if you also look at some other conglomerates, uh, you see that uh, some are showing mm, large profits, particularly banks. So, which means uh, that uh, at the expense of the economy, uh, some companies have been making making money hand over fist. Uh, so, there is going to be a there is going to be a um, offsetting effect of the negative impact to some extent. Uh, but if you look at tourism related, uh, then you are completely uh, sort of almost at nothing once again, right? So uh, you will see the impact uh, showing up, like I said, in the second quarter. When asked his opinion on the import ban imposed on a number of goods, Dr. Harsha Disabha said that some bans are unwise and rather inexplicable and that the government's decision to ban chemical fertilizer is certainly going to show up in the growth figures at some point in time. He also said that since smallholders in the tea industry have seen the repercussions of the ban, the country will start seeing the impacts in the rest of the agricultural sector too in the coming few weeks and months. He was of the opinion that since import and or export businesses, especially import businesses such as vehicles, have been completely stopped, that too will potentially cause a negative growth for the second quarter of this year. When asked about the lingering import restrictions, economist and Sri Lanka Pudujana Peramuna parliamentarian Professor Ranjit Bandara said that since the pandemic is not a normal situation, no country in the world will be or has been able to operate business activities freely, such as in a COVID-19 free situation. Sri Lanka being a global citizen, uh, the COVID-19 impacted uh, profoundly uh, on the economy of Sri Lanka as many countries in the world. And there are quite a large number of research being published, analyses being made, to reveal what the real impact of COVID-19. And if I summarize the findings of all these uh, research, definitely there is a, a serious negative impact over every single economies in the world. He added that despite the import ban, Sri Lanka has resources to be utilized for essential projects such as the vaccination program or the importation of some of the essentials, including medical supplies, and that importing luxury items and vehicles is not a priority at this time. Professor Bandara is of the opinion that Sri Lanka, or any other country for that matter, has not been able to predict the economic impact of the pandemic thus far and that without trying to rush to conclusions or make assumptions, Sri Lanka should try its best to manage the economic impact with the available resources. The impact of the economy by the COVID-19 on the global scale yet to be realized. No one knows what precisely it had impacted so far on the global economy. And there are various predictions and estimates. But realistic, really, strictly speaking, I don't think none of us will be able to present an accurate number. In the same way, the impact over the economy of Sri Lanka yet to be estimated. So some rough estimates are there, uh, looking at uh, the impact over the tourism industry, impact over small and medium scale industries, impact over uh, commercial agriculture, export agriculture, right? But 
we really really not in a position to estimate accurately what the impact and what would be the total impact at the end he further noted that irrespective of the predictions the pandemic has impacted local regional and global economies negatively and it might take a little time to recover and or estimate the true extent of the impact the pandemic has caused according to professor bandara the import ban despite being viewed as a negative development has had a positive impact on the local economy he noted that it has created an environment for the people to focus more on manufacturing what can be manufactured locally we have now resources to be utilized for alternative uses now say for example to continue this vaccination program or to import uh, uh, the some of the essential uh, medical supplies then that of importing motor cars buses or any other luxury items Well, amidst the growing tensions about the state of the economy, Sri Lanka recently took a number of steps to obtain financial assistance from several countries, especially from China, to maintain the value of the Sri Lankan rupee and boost foreign reserves. So far this year, Sri Lanka has entered into currency swap deals and loan agreements for this purpose. When we return, the impact this might have on Sri Lanka's economic trajectory. Welcome back everyone to Investigates. Tonight our focus is on Sri Lanka's economic trajectory amidst the COVID third wave. Now, there are credible views for and against the current economic plan of the government. However, the people in charge of running the country now says that despite there's an opposition to their economic plan, they will continue to pursue their strategy and not follow one that people rejected in the last election. Here's the rest of our investigation. Sri Lanka recently began to bring in currency swap mainly from China and in the last week from Bangladesh. When queried about the situation regarding Sri Lanka's foreign reserves and import cover, renowned economist Dr. Kenneth De Silva said, "These are short-term challenges Sri Lanka as a country has to deal with." and that this is currently being dealt without much weeping or wallowing for one has to manage the legacy balance sheet issue they inherit well sri lanka's economy is always work in progress and it is always good to see that there is a focus to ensure that sri lanka position itself at a high income level group and in this context there is a lot of work that needs to be done because sri lanka has inherited uh, a economic structure which has been heavily dependent on uh, on more import driven production and consumption therefore it has become a, a structural necessity to be changed and therefore as i said sri lanka's economy is always work in progress because we have to address this structural issue within the economy he further noted that therefore he remains extremely optimistic that sri lanka will find its way out of the prevailing situation once again given the short term financing arrangements and cash flow that are in place meanwhile dr harsha de sarma speaking on sri lanka's foreign reserves and debts that needs to be repaid noted that it is embarrassing that sri lanka has had to borrow money from bangladesh you know it just goes to show uh, how poorly we are managing our economy whereas countries like bangladesh are, are managing their economies well given the pandemic uh, you know they have uh, not imposed silly restrictions like we have and they are uh, you know trading with the world 
According to Dr. Harsha Dasalwa, Sri Lanka is currently facing a significant challenge when it comes to debt repayments. Meanwhile, when asked whether Sri Lanka's economy can still bear the economic impacts caused by the pandemic, Dr. Kenneth De Silva says that there is an ill-conceived and baseless fear that Sri Lanka will collapse and that he doubts it very much, having weathered the storm in 2020 and performed relatively better in comparison to some of Sri Lanka's Asian peers. Negative GDP growth rates in 2020 for India, it was minus 8%. For Maldives, minus 32%. Malaysia, minus 5.6%. Singapore, minus 5.4%. Thailand, minus 6.1%. Philippines, minus 9.6%. Sri Lanka's economic trajectory for the next few years is dependent on a couple of factors. One is the current global economic trend, mm -hmm. which is also very positive for 2022 and beyond. We see that the world economy is poised to recover and move into a higher growth trajectory around 4.5% of GDP. That's the current forecast. So that's a positive factor. Number two is basically the overall structural shift that we are seeing within the economy. Now that too is a very encouraging proposition because we are seeing uh, local companies engaged in value-added production and production for uh, re-exports is something that is very encouraging, particularly from an industrialization point of view. We have seen the macroeconomic framework, which is the third and most important mm -hmm. pillar uh, supporting this structural shift that we have now seen, in pla seen taking place. Speaking of the aforementioned World Bank statistics, Dr. Jasova said that it is correct Sri Lanka's economy did contract by 3.3% in 2020. This was at a time when the entire world economy was close to travel, trade and global business and the world faced its worst economic crisis since World War II. He further said that there was little Sri Lanka could do but to remain focused and hopeful. Meanwhile, in response to a question on whether Sri Lanka's economic management has been good as far as the pandemic is concerned, Professor Ranjit Bandara says that there is no system that Sri Lanka can think of as a perfect management system and that every system may have certain loopholes. We have been able to manage it in such a way with a minimum negative impact over the people, over the economy, over the society. The people need to understand that we have a responsibility over it. It may be more than 90%. And that we start engaging in regional and global production networks. We've got to become part of the, the production network of, of, of the world. And, and the moment you start, you know, bringing import restrictions, putting up tariffs, you know, and the same book, we are going to, uh, you know, disengage from the, the trading uh, regime, but rather try to do everything on our own. Uh, the message is clear. Investors understand that we are not willing to partner with the world. And uh, the, the results of this uh, unwise move uh, will be felt in, in, in years to come. Um, so, in my view, we are down the wrong path completely and absolutely. Meanwhile, when asked whether there is anything Sri Lanka can do differently as far as Sri Lanka's current economic management is concerned, Dr. Kenneth Disilva says that there are always new developments in the global economy from a production economy point of view and a central banking standpoint. But if you look at many of the developed countries, some of the Asian countries that developed in the 1960s, you find that their journeys have been more than 15 to 20 years. In fact, beyond 25 years is some of these, these countries have had their economic policies well established and therefore policy consistency comes as a result of that. With policy consistency, there is predictability and businesses love predictability. Now, to get to that point of structure is what Sri Lanka is striving to. And that transformation has just begun and therefore there is a level of uh, patience that is required to see the results in due time. 
I'm sure that overall with this policy framework and the structural shift that we are seeing, particularly on the production side, Sri Lanka will be poised to reap better benefits and a higher GDP growth. He then expressed his views about whether Sri Lanka is in a position to manage the current situation or the situation that is likely to be created in the coming few months with the available resources, especially monetary resources. He noted that even though various parties can make presumptions about the situation and say that the pandemic will continue and that there is no strategy to overcome it, countries such as Vietnam, China, South Korea, Thailand and even the United States have recovered to a large extent. He also expressed hope concerning Sri Lanka's ability to overcome the economic impacts of the pandemic and said that even though Sri Lanka is a small nation or a small economy, the country has been able to address most of the negative impacts of the pandemic so far. He noted that there are many countries in the world that have not been able to introduce at least at least a single vaccine to their population, whereas Sri Lanka is aiming to vaccinate at least 70% of the population. He opined that Sri Lanka will be the first country to have vaccinated such a big portion of its population in the South Asian region. Well, amidst imports restrictions and travel restrictions, the economy of Sri Lanka is at a crossroad. And the decision made by the economic policymakers will decide its direction and future health. Is it on the right track? Does it know where it's going? And most importantly, where will it end up? Well, that's it for tonight's episode of Investigates. I hope you learned a lot about our country's economy. Showbiz Tonight is up next. And I'll be back again next Sunday with another take on another matter concerning you and me. Stay positive, test negative and have a good time.